talking about the obvious title here. So, uh, I can just start first things first, a few words about the person uh, who I am. Who I am. I'm sorry, I slept only four hours, so there might be some open forums or some weird stuff happening. Let's not play it uh, Am I anyone? Uh, so, I'm in Bachelor of Aquatic Sciences. Uh, I'm currently in the uh, Ecology and Evolutionary Biology uh, Master Program at the University of Helsinki. And uh, so, I hope that gives some credibility to what I'm talk going to be talking about today. And as a proof, here's a picture of me doing science for my uh, bachelor's thesis, my uh, master's thesis. Animals from algae. But anyway, uh, so uh, as a disclaimer, I'm going to be taking entertain entertainment way too seriously. So uh, don't take anything like personally. Uh, this is just like a scientist's point of view to everything I'm seeing in the popular media. So the point is basically to give ideas on how to make fictional creatures, fictional flying creatures, more realistic. If you want to take some ideas, if you want to make it, if not, do whatever you want. Uh, just uh, stop in popular media and then get yeah, shows with non existent people would be like, oh no, the dragon is not realistic, we can't do this, or the Harry Potter would not exist, this man would not exist. So the story is generally more important than uh, how it's done. But I want to do it. Here's maybe a few pointers. So let's get to the topic. So why don't oh, dragons or angels or fairies or other things flying through our skies? Because honestly, what would be cooler than having six wings? <laughs> um. So to understand why these don't work, we have to understand what actually works. So I'm going to be mostly talking about real animals, real flying animals, why they work, why, what kind of issues they have and how they have got around that to solve the problems. So, and um, yeah, I will not be talking about insects or invertebrates in general because they are so complex and so diverse that I did not have time to study them to talk about them today. So let's just keep invertebrates. So all the flying vertebrates that I know today are birds, bats, and pterosaurs. And as a side note, like pterosaurs run right away. Actually, they most likely did not have wing structures like this. Uh, this is the kind of the bat type wing structure that is hypothesized. Uh, it is seen, for example, in Jurassic Park. But actually. This uh, is not likely to be the case, and the reason for that is the uh, bone structure of the pterosaur and pterosaur wing. Because uh, here we can see that the bone structure is actually way more similar to birds than to bats. Here's a human arm for birds. So the yeah, the bat's wing is actually just a big hand with a lot of weight inside. But the bird just had, had these feathers sticking out, and pterosaurs had this long little finger where the skin membrane is attached. And the reason why this uh, the bird or the bat type wing structure for pterosaurs is unlikely is that. Bats and birds both are able to fold their wings when they are moving on the ground. You can barely see them in any of these pictures. And uh, so it's quite likely that pterosaurs have been able to do the same thing to hide their wings when they are moving on the ground. Because when they are moving uh, with this uh, wing structure, the issue is that when they are trying to fold their wings, there's a lot of skin flapping around, and when they are moving on the ground, they are likely to hurt themselves. So, actually, the more likely wing 
structure of a third forest is this um, showy yellow, so the kind of the bird type wing structure. So, with that down out of the way, I can start with the actual topic. So, let's start with this, with this picture. It reminds me of me as a child when I thought that pigeons were fat and funny and because they live in cities and in trash, that's from the but then my worldview actually changed when I looked for the first time at a bird's head. This structure here is the keel of the sternum. The sternum is the hard part you can you will have is in the middle of your chest here, and that's also where your pectoral muscles are attached. The pectoral muscles are what do this movement or this movement. And that's also what, what moves the bird wings. So looking at the bird's muscular structure or muscular system, we can see that actually the uh, pectoral muscles, muscle takes almost half of the body size. So after all, birds are not fat, they are just super muscular. And that changed my view of way of viewing the world forever. And with this in mind, I'd like to look at this picture. Because it has everything. It has a cool dude without a shirt on. It has a mostly empty lab. It has people in white coats. It has three wings here. Nice spectrals. Um, yeah. Even though this dude all uh, it has oh, obviously has gone to the gym a few times before filming. So the spectrals there are made for moving his arms. So I cannot see anything that could actually move these wings here. I suppose the creators are expecting us to believe that the muscles are either attached somewhere in the wings or on the back, but at this point we know better. He unfortunately can't fly. But, how have pterosaurs and bats solved this issue? Because uh, comparing to the bird keel, actually pterosaurs have a lot smaller and bats have even less. But the answer is in the bird's way of flying. Because they have a really simple way of batting their wings. They just have one muscle that pulls the wing up, another muscle that pulls the wing down. Bats, however, have a more complex way. They have, in total, they have eight muscles that pull one wing. So four muscles that pull the wing up and four that pull the wing down. So that actually uh, distributes the strength needed for flying or for doing the flying motion. And when you actually look at bats, flying in slow motion, you can see that they don't really flap their wings like this, but they more like swing through the air. And that's also, this is also what gives them all the agility needed to do all the funny or great maneuvers through the air when they can change direction like this and go through amazing obstacle courses. And uh, even though Nobody has even seen. Okay, so uh, and pterosaurs are most likely to have some sort of similar structure, a more evenly distributed strength for flying than uh, likely to bats. But as nobody has ever seen a pterosaur for real, everything about them is just indicating guessing. So. And now I'd actually like to talk about the biggest animals that have been able to fly to know like, what is actually possible. So the first picture here is a quarry master. It's uh, the heaviest flying bird alive today. It weighs 18 kilos and it is heavy enough that it actually needs to run for a little while before being able to take off. But the biggest bird ever known to fly is the Argentavis magnificence. I thought this 
picture was made for a long time before I was coming out of voice. Um, it weighed about 70 kilos and has a wingspan of 7 meters. And it lived in Argentina in areas where there were really strong thermals or, or this upwind, strong uh, warm upwind currents that could lift it and keep it up in the air while, while it was soaring and looking for prey. But the biggest animal hypothesized to ever have been able to fly is the Quenzaco Atlas. For years I thought that there's no way that a thing like this could be able to keep itself in the air, but apparently it seems that it's possible, it's plausible that this, this animal was able to fly and have never been able, or never be happier to be, have had been proven wrong. I have never been happier to have been proven wrong. So this animal weighed about 200 kilos, and yeah, so the question though is the why was the ter heaviest pterosaur almost three times heavier than the heaviest bird that has been able to fly? And the answer lies in their locomotion and how they launch. I would like to show this, this one minute video to illustrate my point. So what we saw there is a fundamental difference that pterosaurs have compared to birds, and that is their way of launching. Pterosaurs launch using their forearms, whereas birds have to jump using their legs to get up in the air and start flapping. So, and the reason why this is, is their uh, locomotion on the ground. So birds aren't bipedal or basically they just walk on two legs, whereas pterosaurs were quadrupedal or they walk on four legs. And this is why um, when the animal gets heavier, birds need to shift a lot of their strength in their legs to be able to walk or even to jump enough to start flapping or get high enough to start flapping. Whereas pterosaurs, when they go heavier, Actually, their forearms, which are also their wings, they got heavier. And that's why all the strength needed actually to launch and to fly went to the same place. And that's why pterosaurs were able to just get to bigger sizes than birds. But yeah, even though uh, these huge animals existed, they both <laughs> need to. Um, take off from a perch or a high place. They can't just be on the ground like this and just get up there. They have to be at the uh, Argentines live in mountains, so they have to either get up from a high tree, really high tree, a strong tree, or from a mountainside. And start flying from there, and the Quetzalcoatl is most likely something really similar. So uh, your, the bird skeleton shown here is from the secretary bird. Just for the curious. And to illustrate the increase in size of the legs of the birds, I have here a scaled by a hummingbird and a bald eagle to the same 
next slide. Um, looking at their leg length, we can see that the, and actually the LinkedIn as well, the bald eagle has thicker legs, longer legs, stronger legs, and a hummingbird that basically needs its legs only to keep up the branch. They don't really jump in the air and fall in the so like that they can just put on their feet right away. But speaking about bald eagles, I would like to mention that animals this size, they don't really fly while flying. They just hover in the air, they use the strong wind currents to uh, soar in the air and look for prey, and they basically just flap only when they're landing or when they're taking off. So, when I, I see uh, dragons like huge dragons like this flapping, flapping around like nobody's business, I generally face balls because they are so heavy that flapping is impossible. It takes so much energy, so much strength that. And it was this side just cannot pull it off. And um, looking at this picture on the right here, I would also like to mention another issue, which is that these dragons are flying on the ocean. And um, the reason for this is the wing shapes. Even though these are bird wings, the appendix works similar for everyone, so we can just talk about them. The first wing shape are active soaring wings found in uh, marine birds, seagulls, albatrosses, or things like that. Uh, so they are useful for flying to strong wind currents going in every direction, and they don't really need to flap. They can just use the wind in their forehead and the tension. They can just fly up around, and that's why birds like albatrosses can stay in the air for a long time at a time without needing to go down. The second wing shape are passive soaring wings found in big birds of prey like eagles and condors. Um, they are huge, they're long and wide, and they are useful for catching the warm upward wind currents uh, to soar. Type are elliptical wings found in uh, most forest dwelling birds like crows and sparrows. They are used for short, uh, short flying birds from either tree to a tree, to a tree or from ground to a tree. Or, and yeah, they are not really used for long flights that much. Then the fourth type is high speed wing designed for design for uh, outspeeding your prey. On the mountains, for example, and the fifth type is hovering wings on hummingbirds. And what I actually find interesting in this picture is that actually the uh, wing bones end pretty much in the cyan part here. So the Bones of the hummingbird are really short, and they just flap these short arms really quickly. And I find it adorable. <laughs> but these birds, like to flap really quickly, you need to be really small because you need to be light. Flapping is takes so much energy, and when the weight of the animal increases, it becomes harder and harder. That's why the animals just don't flap that much anymore. Uh, you can sometimes see like birds like great pits or wagtails flapping, staying in place in the air for like a second or two, but that's really the maximum. These do it for a longer periods of time, but that's when what's what that's what they look for. But I am not done with this picture yet. <laughs> this actually had a few issues that I would still, still like to point out. And the second one being these wings and specifically the feathers. And that, the reason for that is that uh, generally angels are depicted as mammals. And mammals have fur, whereas birds have feathers. But why can't we, can't we just miss the color of them? 
the reason is uh, we have to understand that evolution can only put on what it already has available. And then we have to go back and understand why feathers and fur evolved in the first place. And the reason or the concept of this is feather regulation for keeping the animal warm. And when an animal like a mammal has already a way of feather regulating or has something to keep itself warm, it doesn't have a reason to start evolving something else. Suddenly, like having a patch of different kind of fur that would eventually evolve to something more complex and eventually being able to keep the animal to the life for a short period of time and then suddenly being able to fly. Actually, I don't know the reason why fur cannot evolve to complex structures like fur. I tried to find it out, but I couldn't, and it really annoys me. If somebody knows, please tell me. But for some reason, fur eventually evolved from something like this to complex structures like this, and now they are this strong structure that like, when they are many enough, they can keep an animal. And because of this fundamental difference between birds and mammals, we unfortunately cannot have mix and matches between mammals and birds like this, unfortunately. So basically the only plausible way of a mammal getting to here is a skin membrane like bats have. Even though this lady here would still need a Later, because she will be that like this. And then, last issue with the picture. Last time I counted, mammals have four limbs. And uh, why we don't have more lies as far back in as far back in time as fish. Fish have four limbs. Therefore, mammals are animals that crawl from the land, evolve from the world of fish, have four limbs. And evolving more limbs is something so difficult, so complex, so unlikely that it just does not happen. It's probably even less likely than I would think. So, and yeah, this is the issue I have with franchises like How to Train Your Dragon. Even though a lot of these franchises do that, they're like the evolutionary line or the, of these animals is a complete mystery to me. I have no idea what came, supposedly came first, what evolved from the next, are they supposed to have evolved from the same common ancestor or not? But they have these evolved from birds and these came from somewhere else. So these converse and they progressively lost limbs like this because yeah, losing limbs is possible. You cannot gain, gain limbs, but you can lose them. Snakes don't have any limbs, and whales have lost their hind limbs. But getting them back is a lot more difficult issue because evolution can only build on what it has available. So. Talking about dragons, I will not be discussing fire because I, we don't have any animals that breathe fire, so that's um, out of a biologist pers perspective. But still, looking at all these, all these that are dragon, they generally are depicted as having scales. And all animals that I know that have scales are and exothermic or cold water. And what defines a cold blooded animal is that it, uh, its internal temperature is regulated by the temperature of the environment it is in. And this is a great advantage because, for example, animals like the Komodo dragon, uh, which weighs from 70 to 90 kilos, it only needs to eat one deer and it's fine for a month. Whereas, Try surviving with eating one deer at one time for a month, that will not happen. 
but then being at Qatar, it comes with its other feature, which is that when it gets cold, the metabolism gets lower or slower, and the animal, for example, species barely move during winter. And the metabolism gets so, so slow that my teacher was told me, uh, or at least my biology teacher, told me that they won't call the fight during winter and they all come in stomach and there was still an alive fish inside, which would be impossible during summer because the metabolism itself is so much quicker than the stomach acids would kill the animal in a matter of minutes. Then animals or land animals like uh, land ectotherms like snakes or lizards, they generally have to warm themselves up in the sun before being able to carry them. And this is the fundamental issue I have with uh, dragons with scales, is that if the animal is ectothermic, Uh, 
of evaporating the heat. So that and air source so most likely goes in these, in these uh, big blood vessels in the wings. And also desert animals like uh, desert hedgehogs or desert you know, cutting foxes, they all have big ears with all the blood vessels to help evaporate the heat. And also another limitation of being endothermic that you need a lot of energy, keeping your body temperature constant requires a lot of energy, and you need to eat pretty much all the time, every day, ideally. So my argument is that um, all flying endotherms pretty much, or flying vertebrates pretty much need to function. So all the spline vertebrates that we know have or are endothermic or have been endothermic. Birds have their feathers inside themselves, they their body temperatures around 40 degrees I think. Mammals have fur to insulate themselves. And pterosaurs, even though they were hypothesized to be around uh, uh, to be ectothermic initially. Some recent research has demonstrated that they actually also had some kind of fur or feathers, so this means that they also were at the And uh, yeah, that, those are actually all my points. I'm doing this little recap to remind everyone of what I was talking about. So, animals with wings, they need muscles to fly. Um, they need some means of takeoff. Oh yeah, actually, I know dragons or warriors. Most warriors in the the four limbed dragons. They are generally depicted as the taking off with their hind limbs, which is unlikely. Which I don't think they do that if they have their if they still like walk on four legs on the ground, so please keep that also in mind. And uh, so yeah, take off has to be taking account the means of take off and uh, what wings they use. Then uh, a big animal cannot fly. End of story. Um, in this universe, vertebrates uh, don't have one of four wings. I flying end of the uh, flying vertebrate needs to be end of the that was all from me. Um, if you have questions, we have 10 minutes, and I can also stay with some of those ones too. I can stay at this time. So, thank you for, thank you for coming. I have not thought about 
about it. Or I have tried, but uh, and then again, uh, you know, Twitter is great. Twitter, I don't know how that would fire. Where there's some uh, theories or hypotheses that are going out on the internet that you can read on your own time. I don't really know much about them. There are some possibilities, but then again, how many people will be out of that story? But yeah, actually, this demonstrating issue that I have is that because I always think too far. Like I always, when I try to design creatures, I always, I always go like, okay, this is not possible. I can't do this. This is not possible. I can't do this either. And in the end, I don't do anything. So another uh, reason to take all of this with a grain of salt. Doing stories, doing fantastic animals that are realistic is generally impossible. Yes. So the question is animals with insect wings. Same issue that with uh, the basic of mammals and birds. They this goes in general of how insects work, and I don't want to I don't really explain enough of that. But yeah, the negative they would need basically start being seen to lower extra muscles to do the only things that you have come from somewhere. And basically well, the, if uh, you want them to have extra wings without compromising the uh, leg structure is actually to play with um, what these things have done. Using actually they, the wings that we can do on the skin parts that we can see here are having more from their uh, ribs. I find it really amazing and I still have no idea how it works or how the musculature works, but something like this pretty much could be for more people, but then again, Flying vertebrates, they basically need the skin uh, to play with for better suits to fly. Yes? Uh, so the flying wings, yes. uh, like I said, do they fold back into the sides or are they just always out? So the question was if the uh, wings of the gliding lizards uh, fold back, yes, they do. There's been used a lot. Thank <laughs> you. 